We're joined now by the now undisputed Governor-elect. Welcome back. You were here many months ago. You were barely a blip on the radar during the primaries. We had you on. Now you're the next governor of the state. Congratulations. I, I, I've been called a lot of things, but barely a blip is uh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty hurtful. Hey, <laughs> tell me the truth. That the campaign's over. Yeah. More straight talk now. When you saw Tom Foley surging, and I mean surging, stand to Dan. Dan to Stan. You have to be saying, I blew it. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I never thought we blew it. I, I think, um, you know, I took uh, positions that I believed in. Uh, I didn't change those positions. Um, I wouldn't lie to the people of Connecticut, and and I had faith that uh, we would we would win out. We had a strategy. We deployed that strategy. That strategy worked. Uh, we needed to pull people out of cities and make sure they voted. We did it, uh, and I won. All right, but when you talk about the surge, and you go back and do the autopsy. A lot of people whispered Dan Malloy was too mean in those debates. He came across as, as tough, as mean, and that turned people off. In hindsight, were they correct? I, you know, listen, I think people make their own judgments. Uh, uh, I'm not mean, um, but I'm, I'm tough. Get sharp elbows, right? I'm, I'm tough. I, listen, you, 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 do, you, do you want to hire a wimp to be your governor? Um, <laughs> I, or listen, a prosecutor, they, they, right? These are not, uh, these are not the times uh, to be uh, uh, sitting back. Yeah, I'm a former prosecutor. Uh, you know, uh, Republicans like to, to talk about Christie as a, a great governor. Well, let, let me tell you, he's got more edges than I do. Tom Foley, get under your skin some of those, can't, some of those uh, ads. Called you a liar. Get under your skin. No, I, I think I probably got under his skin a little bit more. Uh, so? But listen, I, I want to thank Tom. He ran, a, he ran his race, uh, ran it the way he wanted to run it. Um, uh, he came uh, close to winning. Uh, he, had, he had the wind to his back, let's be honest, on a national basis. Um, and uh, we just fought every step of the way. I kept telling you folks it was going to be a, a close election. And, and you folks didn't want to uh, <laughs> You didn't want to accept that. I, we knew it was. We knew it from the first time we, we polled. We're folks. jaded. The media people are jaded. You know that. We're jaunders eyes are jaded about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that. I, I'm just going to say that, that you were finding it hard to believe. Uh, we always thought that this was going to be one, two, three point uh, race uh, at, the ma at the most. And, and all of our planning and all of our execution was based around making sure that people in cities uh, voted. It, was no, it, it wasn't happenstance that, that we were able to get the president to come to Bridgeport on Saturday, get the uh, uh, former president, uh, Bill Clinton, to come to Hartford on, uh, on Sunday. This, this was pretty methodical. You mentioned the cities. I threw out a question there on Facebook. I said, hey, I got Dan Malloy coming on. Give me some questions. A bunch of questions came back. One of them was about the cities. They said, listen, ask the new governor-elect. Remind him that the cities, Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, basically gave him this election. What's she going to do to revitalize the cities? Well, listen, I am from a city. I, I grew up in Stanford. Uh, Stanford is a city, 120,000 people, uh, very diverse. I Actually, you came down, uh, I don't know whether you remember this, about five, six years ago to Stanford. And, and, that's right. And drove around with you. That's right. And, 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 you know, it, it has a little bit of everything. I, listen, I'm the first urban or urbanist to be governor of the state of Connecticut in, you know, in 50 years plus. Um, and I understand what the problems are. You know, it's educational systems that are dysfunctional. Uh, it's a tax uh, over-reliance on property taxes, uh, which is, is, is like murder in our cities. I mean, listen, this is the, this is the bargain that Connecticut long has made with, with people. They said, we want you to live in cities. We're going to charge you more taxes. You're not going to be as safe and your schools aren't going to be as good. And then we wonder why cities fail. So you're going to flip the script. We, we have to change. We have to change. How soon do you start? Well, we start day one. I mean, actually, we start today. I hear, you know, we're, we're doing this show. Sunday morning, we're starting now, yeah, right? But, you know, listen, you, you haven't had the governor on this show, and, and now you have the governor-elect. Uh, I, I need to speak uh, through you and through other media outlets so the people of Connecticut actually know what I'm trying to do and trying to, uh, what change I'm trying to bring about in, in, uh, uh, in the state of Connecticut. Part of it's a, an urban agenda, but, but listen, we have an agricultural agenda, a big, big industry in, in Connecticut. We have an educational agenda. We, I put all of this stuff out on, the, on our website, over 76 pages of, of policy considerations. Some of those will be delayed because of how bad the, uh, the economic environment is in Connecticut. But I felt uh, uh, obligated to tell you the direction I wanted to take this state uh, as circumstances improve. Transition time. I'm sure you're knee deep now in figuring out who goes where, what jobs are open. You I know, what are you doing? What what are you doing? <laughs> My resident's right here. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, what jobs are open? All well, these they're all open. Work. I mean, yeah, listen, give me, give me a couple we, names. We, we, there's 28 commissioners yeah. uh, positions. There's deputy commissioners. There's all kinds of, of uh, positions. You're you know, one man uh, stimulus package right now. Well, you know, uh, uh, every one. Of, well, not every one of those positions, but many of those positions are currently held by a candidate. 
Some of them will stay. Most of them will be replaced. Can you give us one name or two right now? Just give us a name. Uh, Nancy Wyman gonna... definitely has a job, and Tim Bannon definitely has a job. <laughs> my chief of Lieutenant staff, Lieutenant Governor, right? Lieutenant Governor. Yeah. yeah but anyone else out there who you thought was really interesting? Who you say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and tell the people now. This person is going to be part of the the Malloy uh, administration. Well, you know, Stan, you've turned me down. So <laughs> I, now listen, we'll, we'll, we'll make the, me, right? we'll, we'll make those uh, announcements in a timely fashion. Uh, there's a process to honor and to go through, including some background uh, work to be done on people. Uh, uh, but I have a great chief of staff, Tim Bannon, who has. A, a, a both experience in the private sector and insurance and pharmaceuticals and practice of law, as well as the public uh, sector, having worked in the uh, um, uh, O'Neill administration and actually having uh, consulted with uh, Republican governors as well. Democrats now rule the roost, right? For the first time in 25 years, Democratic governor, Democratic House uh, controlled House, Democratic controlled Senate, one party rule. Is that a dangerous thing in America? One party ruling the whole roost? Well, you know, people, uh, it, people ask that in, in the media ask that question uh, all through the campaign in, in such a way as to scare people um, in Connecticut. Uh, and, and I think it was one, that was one of the headwinds we had to uh, overcome to, to win this election. It's just the way you asked. Uh, <laughs> you know, is, is something wrong? Listen, I am more fiscally conservative than, than any governor to serve in Connecticut recently. Um, and, uh, and I'm more progressive uh, than any governor to serve uh, in Connecticut in recent times. So, you know, this is an interesting combination. You're going to have to get used to it. You can be a fiscal conservative. You can, you can be uh, at your very core progressive and in some senses uh, almost libertarian um, in some of my views. So I, 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 you're going to have to get used to me. You think there'll be checks and balances? Will there be enough checks and balances to make sure you have that sort of byplay? I mean, that, well, that Stan, interaction? Well, so let me ask it this way. Sure. Uh, you, 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 we've had che quote unquote checks and balances. Mm -hmm. Has it worked? I mean, is Connecticut a strong state? Uh, haven't we lost jobs for 22 years? Uh, haven't we turned our back on some of our core industries? Uh, haven't we failed to grow? Haven't we failed to improve education? I mean, what, what, what has that check? You got a tough job. Has, wait, what has that checks and balances done for us? Let's be honest. All it right. hasn't. It hasn't worked. So I think the people of Connecticut ultimately decided against what they were being told in paid media, and in some cases, uh, uh, mainline media, that, that they were going to go in a different direction. We elected a Democrat for the first time in 24 years. We are going to make changes, but I can assure you, I'm, I'm more fiscal conservative than, than any governor who, who has served in recent times. All right, we're going to come back with more of Governor-elect Dan Malloy. We have some Facebook questions for him, so don't go away. We'll talk about what he has in plan for the state and see what kind of meaningful change is, is in store for you. You're watching The Stan Simpson Show. We are talking with Governor-elect Dan Malloy in his first extensive TV interview since his election. All right, so listen, let's, the election's over. What's the governor-elect do when he's just kicking back, relaxing, when you're just, when you're not campaigning, not meet and greeting, the shoot is off, the tie is off? Cook. Cooking, really? Cook. What yeah. kind of stuff? Uh, let's see. Last night I made chicken salad. Okay. Uh, I got a pretty good recipe for chicken pretty salad. Pretty conservative. I had people over for dinner uh, Sunday night. Uh, made uh, my trademark uh, shrimp parmesan okay. uh, along with cooking some steaks. Uh, I, uh, I love to spend time with uh, my wife and family. I love to have some people over the house and, you know, just, uh, you know, relax. So but no need but for I, a chef having at said the, that, yeah. I like to work. All right. But so no need for a chef at the governor's mansion then. Well, are you, uh, all of these jobs you're trying to <laughs> fill or not fill, what do you want to I'm gonna help you out a little bit I, I, here. I, I, I don't. I don't. I, I imagine I'm not gonna have a whole lot of time to cook as governor. So. All right. Did you go away to relax a little bit? I know you lost your voice after the campaign. Did you get away? Did yeah. You know, I got a bad cold uh, about a month out, and uh, really strained uh, uh, as a result of the all of the you know, speeches and, and all that and, and the cold. I, I, I lost my voice. And it really isn't back to normal quite yet. What part wore you down? We had a debate in Stanford. I was there and you kind of mentioned as an aside to the audience that you were a bit tired of the whole campaign. I thought it was really kind of a revealing comment. What wore you out? In the end of the day, how does it feel when you go through a bruising campaign like this? What's it like when it comes to Election Eve? And well, you know, I think Election Eve is one of those, you know, um, evenings that's just filled with anticipation. Um, am I going to win? Am I going to lose? What, what's going on? You know, do I spend the next four years saying I coulda, shoulda, woulda, uh, or do I spend the next four years uh, um, trying to lead the state that I love so much uh, and that I've prepared for so diligently to lead, uh, try to lead it. Obviously, I, I came out the, the winner in that, and, and, and I have this opportunity to reposition Connecticut, um, to start telling the truth to the people of the state of Connecticut about how bad things are, and they are absolutely ugly. I'm getting that crisis in one minute, but the Facebook questions, again, threw it out there on Facebook, quick questions, there's a lot of feedback, uh, urban issues. 
Uh, diversity. You've been a diversity guy. They want to know, okay, let him put his money where his mouth is. How many blacks and Latinos are on his transition team right now? You know, the transition team hasn't been set. Um, uh, we probably um, uh, will have a structure to, that we'll be announcing shortly. Um, it will consist of a number of working groups on issues. Uh, it will be diverse. Uh, it'll probably have a steering committee uh, larger than the two people who are heading uh, the, the transition, which are Tim Bannon um, and uh, my Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wine. But we'll be diverse. Um, you will have black yeah. Latinos yeah, on there. Yeah. A guy from the gym, Abraham, read the piece. He said, listen, ask the new governor about privatization. He wants to create jobs. He wants to downsize government. How about jobs like maintenance and jobs like IT? Downsize that. Not downsize it, but uh, contract it out. Privatize it. You know, I, I, you know, I, think, I, I think privatization uh, works in certain areas. Uh, but I got to tell you, as mayor, I deprivatized Why? a certain thing. Because, because it didn't work. I mean, it, it's frequently advertised as this panacea uh, to greater safety. I, I found that, that the properly trained and, and empowered workforce of a city could actually beat the prices that we were being offered um, and become more oh, really? efficient. Yeah, listen, I was mayor for 14 years. Yeah. Uh, by the time I was done being mayor, we had increased our population by 12,000 people and we downsized our city side workforce by 8.4%. You go find somebody else who's done that in the nation. Well, you know they disputed those numbers. I won't get into all that no, stuff. No, but no, no, actually, they, they never dis disputed that number. That, okay. that, that's, that, that's not true. As far as jobs created, I don't want to revisit the whole yeah, case. Uh, and 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 the whole dispute about jobs is 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 was was made up. We, we Stanford had more jobs every year between 1996 and 2007 than it had in 1995. Um, you guys, you know, you, 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 there was a guy who had an axe to grind, and he wrote a story a particular way. Um, the reality is, we had more jobs every year until two, two actually till the third quarter, to the fourth quarter of 2007 than we had in 1995. During that period of time, we. Were we're absolutely repositioning Stanford from an old industrial city, just like New Haven and Bridgeport and Hartford are old industrial cities, to one of the financial capitals of the world. But let me challenge you on privatization. If you're saying that if you contract the jobs out to the private sector and that you're not getting a competitive bid, does that speak to the quality of businesses in Connecticut? Because it would seem that that would be a good way to, one, create jobs in the well, state. Well, privatization and doesn't create jobs. I mean, now listen, do, does sending jobs to India uh, uh, create jobs? Well, if you have IT and you farm it out to a Connecticut company, you know, industrial technology, if you had your maintenance and, and people... And if they then and further uh, outsource that to India, has okay. that done anything in... Well, can, can you put a caveat in there, Mr. Murray? Can you put a caveat that if you have a, a state-contracted job that you can't outsource that? Well, why not make sure that your workforce is the best trained workforce, the most empowered workforce, and give them an opportunity to, to reward you with by, by creating the same efficiencies um, that you would give to, to, to companies. Okay. Uh, you know, I, 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 that's, that's the way I, I would prefer to go. Now, having said that, I also, I told you I deprivatized. I deprivatized garbage collection uh, uh, for uh, multi-unit, uh, 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 multi-family units in Stanford, and, and we saved money by doing it. Um, we deprivatized certain other functions. We also uh, moved in the direction of privatizing the management of certain functions, not not the not the worker bees, not the, the, the but the management. So I mean, I, I I'm not dead set against privatization, but I don't see it as a panacea. Okay. So how are you going to create jobs? You know, it all comes down to whoever was going to win this thing here was the person people felt that this guy could create jobs. How do you create them? You 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 set an environment in which your state becomes more attractive than other states. Uh, I spoke. Like what? Uh, uh, well, first of all, I think we. Should should not turn our back as we have for 30 years on the insurance industry. I, I want to compete for every insurance job that's going to be located anywhere in the country. I think uh, we have to understand why we lost so many insurance jobs over a long period of time. Even and why is that? In, in, in 30 have, seconds, why did we lose all those jobs? Because we took our eye off the ball and, and, and we took insurance for granted and we didn't compete. And so when governors were calling the presidents of companies that are based here in Hartford and asking them to move jobs or open, open uh, new jobs in, in Iowa or or South Dakota uh, or Atlanta, uh, we weren't competing for those same jobs. So it, we, we took our eye off the ball, and, and those days are over. So again, make sure we're clear, you create an environment. How long does that take? People out of work now, 10% unemployment rate. How long will it take to create an environment where people outside say, hey, Connecticut's back in business? Well, you know, listen, 10% unemployment uh, is reflective of, as you know, uh, uh, the deepest national recession near depression uh, caused by, uh, I think, failed policies of the Bush administration. Uh, 
Um, uh, first, number one, you stop digging so the hole doesn't get deeper. Number two, you set an environment which, which includes infrastructure investment uh, in the state of Connecticut, and you go after industries, biotech, biomed, health sciences, uh, O-line insurance, O-line reinsurance, uh, financial services, nanotechnology, uh, precision manufacturing, uh, and then general manufacturing, because I absolutely believe that the United States is going to see a level of reindustrialization that we uh, did not envision five years ago. But that's going to require two things to happen. Number one, the national, I mean, the international economy has to stabilize and start to grow. When that happens, you're going to see fossil fuel prices go through the roof again. That's going to curtail uh, the continuing process of uh, deindustrialization in the United States to, to foreign countries. Uh, and the reason it's going to curtail that is the cost of moving raw materials or half finished materials to those countries and then moving finished products to this country is going to be too great. So this is the, this is the question for Connecticut. We lost jobs for 22 years, many manufacturing jobs, even though the rest of the country, 48 states, only uh, Michigan and ourselves failed to grow jobs. They shared in the creation of 22.7 million uh, jobs in that, that period of time. Are we going to change significantly enough in Connecticut to be attractive uh, to see those jobs move? All right, we're going to ask you about the next hot sector in Connecticut after this. They're wrapping me up real hard. What's the next hot sector here for jobs? When we come back, don't go away. We'll continue our conversation with Governor-elect Dan Malloy as he begins his transition to the chiefs of the state's chief elected officer. Don't go away. Closing things out with Governor like Dan Malloy in his first extensive TV interview. Just like saying that to yeah. everybody else. So, yeah. all right. So, hot sectors now. You're the jobs guy. This has just been put on your lap. You outline what you're going to do. Give us two hot sectors in Connecticut we can expect. Now, That's alternative years. energy uh, okay. uh, on two fronts. Uh, fuel cell technology development um, uh, is going to be hot. Uh, we have about 20% of the world's workforce on fuel cell technology working in Connecticut. We should grow that industry here. We should make sure that the man manufacturing processes that, that develop um, are, are developed here and put into place here and, and that we continue to lead in, in that industry. Uh, uh, other uh, green technologies, but particularly on the use of, of technology Technology itself to save energy costs is going to be a hot industry in Connecticut. Um, uh, so I think we need to, to foster both of those. How about health care? You have UConn Hospital, I, I, I said, St. Francis. In, in, the, in, in the prior segment, I mentioned biotech, biomed, right. health yeah. sciences. You know, I want to see a much larger investment in and around the, the UConn Health Center. Uh, not so much about the replacement of beds in a hospital, uh, but building up the uh, uh, research infrastructure. Uh, I think if we if we make that a world class class operation and uh, and use it in conjunction with the Yale world-class operation uh, around their medical programs, biotech and biomed research, uh, then Connecticut becomes a real leader uh, in that industry. If you draw a line between Baltimore and Boston, uh, that corridor uh, is biomed, biotech uh, central uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, we, we should play a larger role, and, and I'm hopeful that four years from now I can come back and say, listen, we made the kinds of investments necessary, uh, so much so that we've, we've picked up 30,000 jobs in and UConn Medical, quiet as it kept, is an emerging voice internationally in biomed. Well, in biomed, they're particularly a, a, a leading voice now in stem cell research, right. and, and uh, that's something that, that my administration will absolutely support. Uh, I'd like to broaden it. Uh, we have a unique opportunity based on some recent federal uh, court decisions to, to play an even larger role as a state funder as opposed to a federal funder, uh, uh, which may allow for the development of more or the movement of more talent into Connecticut to do that kind of research. I want to play a role. President Obama came in to stump for you. Quiet as it kept behind the scenes. Did you say, hey guys, uh, can you go somewhere else? You, this what's is that like weird. having the president oh. come in? And were you concerned that he's too toxic right now? No. no Why not? No, because he's, a, because he's a great president. I understand that, that people's popularity goes up and down. I, I'll, I'll just tell you that, that 40 years from now, we'll be reading history books that will compare what was accomplished in the first two years of the Obama administration and this Congress uh, with what FDR did. Uh, uh, we say the economy, righted the ship. Uh, people uh, have, uh, you know, uh, they want instantaneous results uh, in, in an environment where more damage was done to our economy than at any time since uh, the Great Depression. Uh, uh, he, he led masterfully. Uh, it'll be appreciated in the future. No, I, I, I don't uh, begrudge so or, or about deny that. Uh, okay. uh, the president. Yeah. Bill Clinton came in for you too, right? Bill Clinton's been a friend. And, and How do you uh, compare those two guys, Clinton and Obama? You've had a chance to talk to them, chat with them. How do you compare their, their two styles well, of, both of charisma? Very, 
they're both very uh, bright guys. Charismatic I think, I think, guys, I think right? They're both charismatic, different ways. I, I think uh, 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 President Clinton um, is the best uh, former president we've ever had. Wow. I, I think, well, just look at the, the work right. the foundation is mm -hmm. doing. I mean, really changing tens of millions of people's lives around the country, uh, around the world. Uh, clean water, um, uh, research, uh, access to capital uh, on a micro and mini basis. Uh, uh, you know, it's just really hard, tremendous work, which is a, a capstone to, I think, what was a great presidency. I, I understand there were problems of personal behavior and that sort of thing. This was a great president, did a great job, created 22,700,000 jobs during the time that he was president. We, we, we should be so lucky. Two minutes. What advice did President Clinton give you quietly, and what advice did President Obama give you quietly? Uh, you know, we, I, I, I've had discussions with both uh, of the gentlemen uh, while they were here. You know, they said, just, just keep going. Um, the, the, I, I think... Uh, they said more than that. Now, come on. Well, you know, the, the, the conversations that I have with the President of the United States and the conversations I have with the former President of the United States are, are, are just that. They're private. But, but you, you know, know I, I think... Not even show, But I think... When, but, I, but I was going to say this, that, that President Clinton made it very clear uh, uh, that that what we needed to do was stand up for our values and and that Democrats have done some tremendous things that are underappreciated at the moment but will it be appreciated in the future um, and uh, and you know I'm very happy that that the Democratic Party maintained control of the Senate uh, I think uh, uh, what we would have seen in the Congress of the United States just just on the student loan basis mm -hmm. they, they you know the Republican agenda was to put the student loan pool back in the hands of the private sector jumping uh, interest rates and making more people on, ineligible for uh, those kinds of loans. Uh, I, you know, I, I stand with the Congress of the United States that made college more affordable for the first time in 30 years uh, for uh, uh, everyday working people in the United States. How about this? In about 30 seconds, President Obama calls you. The new governor elect says, listen, give me some advice. I got shellacked here nationally. What would you tell me as a president? I, I'll tell you what I told the president uh, okay. when he called me. All right. Um, you know, Even better. Yeah, right, you know, <laughs> Mr. President, we, we both have agendas to, to carry out, and uh, we have to do what's right for our state and for our nation and keep up the good work. You don't tell me advice. How do you get that support back? You lost a lot of support here. In about you 30 know, seconds. I, I, I don't think that this is a, a man who lives for the moment. He lives for uh, the history and, and, for Legacy, the, yeah. and, and for what good will have uh, been accomplished. And, and I, I just go back to what I said to you already, Stan. I, I think that, that history will judge the stabilization of the American economy as the most important work accomplished by this administration. 15 seconds. A hard <laughs> 15. How do you judge the legacy of Jody Rell? You were not always a big fan of her leadership. How will legacy treat, how will history treat her? Uh, they will treat her as, as a fine human being who uh, established a new sense of ethics uh, in the aftermath of, of a terrible episode in, in Connecticut's history um, uh, with respect to uh, how she did other things. We're very different people. Uh, I will be a far more activist. You'll see me. Uh, I'll do these kinds of interviews. We're going to invest in infrastructure. We're going to get Connecticut moving again. We're going to have a, a governor who's uh, working day in and day in, uh, out uh, to create jobs. That's what we're going to be. I just borrowed 15 more seconds. This is a hard 50, 50 yeah, firm go. achievement gap. This is can't, how this works? It, it's how it works. We can't leave without the achievement gap question. The widest achievement gap in America, white kids, black Latino youth, uh, Connecticut did not compete for those race to the top dollars. Many said it was a lack of poor, or it was poor leadership from the governor. What would you do in five seconds to well, change that? Only 12 states did get that money, so okay. let's, let's just put but it... But Connecticut has the widest in the country. But, compelling story. Sure, sure we do. Five seconds. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, universal pre-K is the start. Okay, that's good five seconds. All right. Good, I like that. Thanks to my governor-elect, Dan Malloy. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it.